The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Tonight and tomorrow night's lesson is going to be very important to this subject matter. Both these lessons, they'll, they'll go back to back on it. Both of them are very important to understand what's going on in Hebrews 10 in our passage. Um, tonight we're looking at Hebrews 10, uh, 26 and 27, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about the danger of sinning willfully. He says, for if we go on sinning willfully, now, this is a key here. After, this is a key to that. A lot of people just deal with sinning willfully and don't pay any attention to what the rest of this says. It says, if, if we go on, we'll talk about more de the details of it, but it says, if we go on sinning willfully after, now that's a very important to this subject that's going to go on here for the next few verses. Uh, after receiving the knowledge, and that's the word, that's a definite article with epinosis. That's that's becoming totally enlightened on a subject, a doctrinal subject. If we go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, watch this. There is no longer, actually, there is no. It doesn't say is there. There no longer remains. A sacrifice for sins. But what does remain. Here's what look at verse 27. But here's what does remain. But a certain terrifying expectation of judgment. And the fury of fire which will consume the adversary. And then he goes on to explain more. So. You know. Wow, I mean, what's he talking about here? <laughs> uh, this is pretty tough, isn't it? And, and it's going to take a couple lessons of background in order for you to understand this because there's so much misinterpretation of this. There is so much misinterpretation of this. And you can see why, maybe, if somebody just dropped in on the subject and hadn't been paying attention to everything going on in the book of Hebrews, this could be a really, and it is, People take this and run them crazy with it. So we're going to try to get, but it'll take us a little bit of background to really understand where the writer is going here. Okay? So let's pause. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it nor apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be at least in three categories. It could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue, or vert sin. And what carnality is, is the opposite of spirituality. The Holy Spirit still indwells you, but you're living carnal. And evidence of carnality is personal sin. And, and listen, just for a moment, look up here, just for a moment. The fact that you can, you, the fact that you can acknowledge what sin is and what sin isn't shows spiritual growth. Because Romans 3.20 20, 20, Romans 3.20 says, it is the knowledge of the law that you realize what sin is. In other words, if you weren't, if you didn't know what the, I mean, what, I mean God holds you accountable for sin because, the, because he's put a law on it, right? But you wouldn't know what sin is. You could know culturally or something, but I'm talking about Bible where he holds you accountable. It's because the scripture said that's sin. I mean, there, Paul says, how would I have known what covetousness was had the Bible not identified what covetousness was? Now when I do it, I know that's sin. Say, how would I know that stealing's a sin unless the Bible says stealing's a sin? How would I know the sin of partiality is a sin unless the Bible tells me so? Right? So, I mean, the fact that w we come to a place when we say evidence of carnality is sin that's a much bigger idea than we might think it is. 
because it shows some spiritual growth maturity in your life, some, some spiritual growth in you to be able to recognize. When I say mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue and avert sins, man, I've just laid out a whole big deal here. The truth of the matter is the Bible tells you what sin is. I just happen to be a pastor of a spiritual mature church where I can lay that out there. And, and every once in a while, I realize I'm also on the Internet. And I've got to go back and talk to some people on the Internet. But the fact that I can say confess your sin is really a big deal because it says that, you know, from the word of God that that's called sin. And the evidence now is that I have done that. And now I confess and I return to fellowship in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty powerful idea. I mean, sometimes we pop it around here like cha-ching, cha-ching. And I think sometimes they just go over their heads. And so every once in a while, I'm reminded every while. Every once in a while, somebody will come into the office and say, hey, I, there's some things I don't understand. How is this possible? And yada, yada. And I go like, whoa, maybe I ought to stop. And, and so now I'm back, back to our, our prayer. <laughs> okay. So evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, could be sins, sins overt sins or sins of the tongue that the Bible has declared these are sins. And... Uh, what do I do about it? I, I, I confess my sin. I first John 1 9 and confess my sin. He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. That's the work of Christ on the cross with his blood. The blood cleanses nothing but the blood. And when I confess my sin as a believer, that operates in my life, not for salvation, but for spirituality. And there it is. And when it comes to Bible study, it's important the Holy Spirit teach us the truth and recall it and do all those things that he is able to do because we are knowledgeable of it from the word of God. So let's have prayer. I give you a moment of silence through your belief as a believer priest to confess sin if necessary. And then we'll pop into our, our prayer. Well, father, how thankful we are tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. And we pray father that, I mean, there's sometimes we just take things for granted and rightly so because we're in a state of maturity in our, spiritual growth and sometimes don't realize until it becomes a, an issue in somebody's life what are you talking about and then you go back and you do some basics and uh, I think it's good preparation for us for all of us not to overthink or over guess people we're trying to talk to tonight father people will need, really need to put on their spiritual thinking cap like Peter talks about when you study Paul in first Peter 3 they'll need it tonight and tomorrow night for sure to understand a difficult passage for we've made our prayer in Jesus name amen did you hear a vibration somebody driving by with the phone uh, with the radio on right or something probably that's, that's when I notice my house doesn't ever vibrate when a teenager comes by in a truck or a car and has got whatever he's playing is. And my house vibrates and I go like, hey, is that an earthquake? No, it's just a teenager out, which is okay. I was one, one time. I put a straight pipe on my little motorcycle I had to put it wasn't loud enough for me so I put it on there and my mother told me if I drove in the yard with it running she was going to sell it and get rid of it so when I would get close I'd have to turn it off and coast in <laughs> that thing roared but anyhow here, here's what's missing when you jump into the 10th chapter here's what's missing and this is really important here's what's missing is that this is the fourth of five warnings given by the writer of Hebrews to Jewish believers in 64 AD. And I'll tell you why that's important. Because if, if you know anything about Israel's history, then you know in 70 AD, Rome came in and put them under the fifth cycle of discipline. If you know anything about Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, put them under the fifth cycle, and it was terrible. But we knew how terrible it was going to be. And listen, 
Josephus, when he writes about it, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, Josephus, the Jewish historian, what he writes about is it, pretty bad. Well, let me tell you, not even he could write how bad it was. He couldn't do it. And he writes, he writes that it was pretty bad. But if you want to know how bad the fifth cycle was, you've got to go back and read Deuteronomy. And you've got to go back and read Deuteronomy 28. You've got to go back. You've got to look for the fifth. You remember there are five cycles. You've got to pay attention to the fifth. I mean, the fifth is so bad. It's difficult for people to write about it. What people do under the fifth cycle is so inhumane that civilized people who haven't gone through it can't write about it. Hmm. And when he writes the book of Hebrews, sometimes we don't pay attention to dates like that. But when he writes it, it's somewhere around 64, 65 and they're going to go under the 5th and 70 A.D. I mean, that's how close this book is to them going under. And he issues five warnings to Jewish believers. Do you know why this is called the book of Hebrews? This is written in Hebrews. Jewish converts to Christianity. And he warns them. Five times he warns them of what's going to happen, and they should never give up on Christ. Do not go back to the law. Do not go back to the old system. Because the old system is going to be your nightmare. And you really need to understand what he was writing to them about with great urgency. There are five, and listen, you can imagine that these five passages are the most debated, the most confused, and the most gobbledygook theology you could ever read. Because people don't know under don't understand the background to it. They don't understand the five cycles. I mean, I had a pastor not long ago that wrote me and said, I don't see where you get this idea of five cycles of divine discipline. So I, I wrote them back. I, 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 I broke them down. I took the passages. I said, here's cycle one. Here's cycle two. I mean, I don't know. Just had a good pastor myself. I mean, what can I tell you? Just had a great, a great pastor that taught all this. I mean, and uh, if people will be wise, they'll listen to good pastors that teach them this stuff. And so I, I wrote him back. I put Leviticus down, Deuteronomy, and I laid it down. I went, look, you, you've just once you see it, you'll see it. And so I said, here are these verses. Here's one, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four. Then he wrote me back and he said, wow, how did I miss that? I don't know. Listen, there are a lot of stuff we miss, but you just got a good guy who sets it down there and knocks it all out. And he had a good pastor, right? I mean, this is not coincidental. A guy just don't wind up one day in a light bulb. I mean, you just centered a good man that give, that give you a really good head start. And then you just take it to, to a level. And I'm just fortunate with that. I mean, I don't know why. I just hungry for the word of God. And God put me with good people who fed me. I mean, I'm just fortunate. But, uh, there, but there are five warnings to Jewish believers regarding apostate reversionism and and you do not want to go back to you do not want to go back to the priest nation of Israel you're under the new covenant you're under the high priesthood of Jesus Christ stay there don't go back do not go back so i wrote them down for you the five warnings um and, and personally in this church we've studied all these personally but uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, one through four, there's a key word in there, don't drift away. In the third chapter, I just pulled a few off, but chapter three and four of Hebrews deals with the second one. And the second one comes from Psalms 95, and it's all about the hardening of the heart. The third one is in Hebrews 5, 11 through the sixth chapter, verse 12. And... Uh, Chapter 6, verse 6 is a key verse. Uh, fallen away. The key, the words are fallen away. 
Uh, then uh, in our passage, which uh, is the fifth warning, we pick up verse 26. It, it actually starts in verse 26, but I add 25 because 25 is important to the whole thing. So I, I add 25 because it helps you understand it. 25 through 39, it is forsake, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. What were they doing? They were going back to the, to the Jewish assembly, leaving the Christian assembly. They went back to law rather than grace. They went back, you know that? And so this is, this has so much bigger implications to what these people were going through at the time they were in it. Um, and then the, the fifth one is in Hebrews 12, 14 through 29, and he emphasizes you're coming short of the grace. I do not come short of the grace. Do not come short of grace. That's a powerful, and that's a powerful idea. And, and they were. They were coming way short. Of, when you go back to the law, you have to, you have to abandon grace. You abandon grace under the new covenant, you ain't got a dog chance. <laughs> you abandon grace. Grace is everything. It is everything. Once you come through Christ to God under the new covenant, grace is everything. And, uh, but anyhow, there are five warnings at, uh, to the Jewish believers regarding apostate reversionism. Uh, which we will we will talk about in the days to come. I, I, does your does your next line say w well, W E L? Well, it shouldn't be. It should be we. Uh, I saw it on my paper. And I went, w how did that happen? Um, my secretary <laughs> I reached over for a cup of coffee and hit the wrong button. I don't know where I was going. We have divided the fourth warning, which we're talking about into two sections for a study because there's no way I could ever get it out there and you understand it in one study. I'm not that smart. I have to take my time. So in the first, set, in the first uh, section of the fourth warning will be verses 25 through 31. And the subject that is the writer is pushing is terrifying an expectation of judgment. Now, I want you to see it. So let's, let's go back and put our eyes on it. Look at verse 27 because there's two sections. The... 25, well, I'll talk about it in a moment, but you can see this section I've got here. Look at verse 27. But a certain terrifying expectation of judgment. Now look down to verse 31. No, no, not 31. Uh, 30, 30, yeah, 31. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Are you with me? So you can see that that's in that fifth. That's the reason I broke that down because I want you to see what he's saying. And so I broke that. And I call that section uh, 25 through 31, I call that section terrifying the expectation of judgment. Are you with me? In the second section of this, remember I'm talking about the fourth warning in the book of Hebrews. I broke the second section down into 32 through 39 because now he brings it into practical application. See, he's dealing with the theology of the five cycle and the danger of going back into priest nation of Israel and leaving the church because all of that, listen, all of that is out and about to disappear. And so what he says here is a, a great conflict of suffering. And when you look at verse 32, you will see that. But remember the former days when after being light, you endured great conflict of suffering. And then he goes on to describe that they were under persecution suffering. We call it undeserved suffering for Christ. And, uh, uh, and so what I did is I broke this, I broke the fourth warning down because it's so big and so, it requires so much more teaching, in, in my opinion, involved with it for you to understand it. I broke these down in two sections. Now, let me talk about the three in, in what, what I'm going to call first section. That would be verses 25 through 31 I covered tonight. Okay? And it's the danger of sinning willfully after, remember that? After being enlightened. Hebrews 10, 26, 27 is important because it's one Greek sentence. Now, it's important. It's one Greek sentence. It should be studied as one thought. There are four grammatical factors needed to be pointed out to you. The first one is really important because in verse 
26, which starts this se section, verse 26, see the word for? That's gar. That's gar. And g the gar here is a casual conjunction. It's a conjunction, but it's known as casual. And, and what it's doing, it's a trailer hitch. It's hooking you up to verse 25. In other words, 26 through 39 we're, is working off verse 25. Four, it's a trailer hitch. It's a conjunction that starts off a whole section of study that says, verse 25, not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, as you see the day drawing near. Now for them, the day that's drawing near for them in this warning is going to be the fifth cycle. The day, the greater day that's drawing near is the second coming of Christ, okay? But the day that is on the docket, the, what's next on God's schedule is they're going to, he's going to put the priest nation of Israel for murdering his son. You understand? They, they committed a lot of sin against God. Nothing that bad. Are you with me? Jesus warned about it in the parable of the tenant. The tenant? We'll talk about it. I mean, you murdered his son. Oh, you know, they, he, sent, he sent a priest, he sent a priest, he sent a priest, he sent a prophet, 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 all that. Then, you know, you know servants, and then he sent his son. Certainly they'll believe him. Hmm. Murdered him? And then Jesus, and J Jesus gave that parable, and Jesus said, well, what, what do you think should be done to, the, to those who did that? Oh, you ought to listen to their answer because he went, cha-ching. <laughs> you got that right. Listen, he's talking about his own destiny, wasn't he? When he gave that parable, he, he was the key player in it, the parable. I mean, he was the son that they're going to murder and throw, out, throw outside the city. They're, you know what that means? They disowned him. Not enough to kill him. Threw him, on a, threw him out on a trashy, tra a, a garbage dump. I mean, how bad is that? And when he gave the parable, he knew he was the son in the parable. See, a lot of times we don't pay any attention. All of his parables were like that. All the parables were great stories like that. And they were all preparing him for what he was going to have to do for us. I don't know. That's beyond me to understand. The first grammar is the word for because it connects us back to 25, not forsaking our assembling ourselves together as the manner of some. And listen, most of us would have probably said, well, who would have blamed them? Because they were being, when you read verses 32, when you read verses 32 through 39, would you read that they were being persecuted? Their property was being confiscated. They were being run over by semi-trucks every day because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And most people would have said, well, I don't blame them for giving them up. Except for God. God says you don't do that. Christ didn't do it for you. But he knew what he was going to have to go through, but he went through it all for you and I. He didn't do it. He didn't. He didn't walk out because it got tough. And listen, God has a special word for those who hold tight to their faith. It's called a martyr. And let me tell you, if you know anything about martyrs in the book of Revelation, you will call it, you will find it's a high calling. It's not low ball, it's high ball. How God honors the martyrs is unbelievable. But most of us would have said, listen, I don't blame you, son. I don't blame you. 
my, my, my dear sister, I don't blame you. Mama, I don't blame you for going back. I know things are tough. Mm -mm. That's when God, God shines the greatest. That's when, God, that's, when, that's when the light really shines so that other people can see. Listen, one of the greatest, and listen, he'll be honored in ways you can't imagine. The greatest mission that Stephen had was to die with the name of Christ on his lips. He honored, listen, not only did he honor Stephen in time, but he will honor Stephen in eternity as one of the great martyrs. Right? I mean, who doesn't know about Stephen? I mean, who doesn't know about Stephen? Well, anyhow. The second grammatical, the, gra the second grammar factor is that the word if in verse 26 is a first class condition. Now, we know that the first class condition around here means that what's true in the apotheosis, the if, is true in the apotheosis, the then. Now, it's up to you to decide. You don't have to look for the if, but you do have to look for the then. All right? So here's how it reads. If... If this is true, then the then is true. If we, church age believers, go on sinning, present active participle, willfully, willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, notice that's a definite article with epinosis. That means coming into full enlightenment of a doctrinal truth. Then, look what he says. Then there is no longer there, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. If you throw out Christ, there is no other solution. That, and that's what they were about to do. They were about to go back to the old system of shadow Christology, not historical Christology. They would go back to the law, not grace. And listen, what they were going back to was about to go through the worst discipline that you could ever imagine put upon a people the fifth cycle of discipline that, that see that's what we know from studying history um, the third grammar factor is the main verb remember 26 27 is a sentence so you look for a main verb the main verb is the word remain that was just mentioned in point two there no longer remains. Notice that's a present, a present middle in, uh, indicative. That ind is an indicative. That's a main verb. The main verb. The third factor is the main verb. The word remains of this Greek sentence. It is important to verse 27. But, which is adversative contrast, in contrast, but in contrast, but in contrast, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. That's because you have forsaken the only sacrifice for sin. You know, the writer has already pounded that chapter 8, 9, and 10 before we got here. There, Jesus Christ died one offered his body one death for all sin for all time. Can't, you can't, but a terrified expectation of judgment and the fury of fire. Now, I want to show you something. See the word and? I, I, I bold printed it. That's an adjunctive, that's, that's uh, an adjunctive conjunctive of conjunction of nouns. That should be conjunction. That's an adjunctive conjunction of nouns. Now, let me show them to you. Let me show them to you. <laughs> See the word of judgment? Circle it. I'd, I'd recommend you circle it on your paper for now. Uh, of judgment. A terrifying expectation describes the judgment. See, but the judgment is what we're after. With that adjunctive conjunction of nouns, the fury is a description of the fire of the fire is what we're looking for. We're talking about 
the judgment of fire. Okay? And we're talking about it in time. Then he, and then he uses, see the word which will? Well, the, the, the subject that's being put, which will, means, here's what it means. Here's what it includes. The terrified expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will. Notice that this is a present active participle of mellow. And what will it do? What will the terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries? This word mellow we'll come back to in a little while, but mellow Mellow is a, a, a kind of an interesting idea. They translate it will. It means it's about, it's, it's, it's about the expectation is about to happen. And the word consume is typically the word to eat, to eat, to consume some. Did you eat all your lunch, son? Right? You look down at the plate and it's half there. Well. It means to consume, or and it's a present active infinitive, or to devour the adversary. This word adversary is an interesting word because it's made up of three words. You can't see them until I identify them to you. H-U-P is hoopo, H-U-P-O. That's a preposition. The E-N is is the preposition en and then the word is a n i o s when you put all those words together it it identifies an extreme form of opposition something that's adversarial and antagonistic and it's at the extreme side I think I mentioned that, extreme form. See that? And it's extreme. And what that's going to wind up to be in these people's life that go back is going to be the fifth cycle. It's going to be the fifth cycle to the Jewish nation and those who go back to that will be caught in it because God is going to he give a heads up to the church to get out, right? The Acts 1.8, he tells them, do it. Go as missionaries. Go now. In Acts 8.1, he pushes them with persecution. He allows the persecution to come in and tells them, get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Go out and be missionaries. It's about to come down the pike. And there were a lot that, that did that, and they went out. When you read Acts 8, 1, persecution starts. Everybody that knows but church history knows this. In verse 4, they went out as missionaries. They went out just like Acts 1, 8 told them. But listen, a majority stayed. See, he gave them a heads up. In, in 33 A.D., he gave them a heads up. Paul's persecution, Paul three years later, Paul gets saved. But he, Paul started this whole thing in 33. It'll, he won't get, by the time we get to the ninth chapter, it's 36. And God is telling these people, get out of here. You Christians, leave. Get out of here. Run to the hills. Get out of here. The fifth's coming. Get out of here. And... Uh, but you got to know the word of God to know that. But they were telling them, go, 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 and go as missionaries. And a lot went. The grace-oriented, enlightened people left. And the others that went back, they went through. They went through, I, I'll tell you, they went through some stuff that you will find it difficult to read. You will find it difficult to read. Here's the fourth factor. The fourth factor is the identifying two participles that work off the main verb. 
There are two present active participle. One is sinning willfully, and the other connects the terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will mellow, which is about to happen. It, it, it involves intention uh, that will consume the adversaries. Now, look at your paper on the bottom. See the word remain? See that? That's the main verb. We got a present active participle up here, and we have a present active participle up there. So what I want you to do is connect them like that. I, I put everything up. Just draw lines up there, you know. Connect them. They, these two participles are working off from the word remains. I'm going to go back and read it to you. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the full uh, enlightenment of the knowledge of doctrinal truth, then there no longer remains. Now, see the word sinning willfully up there? Present active participle, right? All right. We got the main verb is the word remains, apolepo, present, middle, indicative. But... In contrast to that, in contrast, in contrast, we've, we've received, you're doing something that's just so obvious you shouldn't be doing it. You're sinfully and willfully against revealed enlightened truth of the word of God that's relevant to you now. See, all of these, that's a, that's a present active participle. This is a present middle indicative. See, they're all the present tenses are, are stuff going on now. It's a present tense. It's continuous action now. Willfully is a wonder, is an interesting Greek word. It means to know better, but to do it anyway. I know better, but I did it anyway. Why would you do that, son? I don't know. Uh, yeah, you do. Everybody knows why he does something. took one of my mother's cigarettes when I was about 11 or 12. Who knew that anybody counted the number of cigarettes in a package? My mother did. She knew how many lucky strikes was in a pack at 21. How do I know? Because I got one. My mother, there's only three of us in the family. She asked Bud if he had gotten into her cigarettes because he smoked camels. But this is hardcore stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, he was a tough boy, wasn't he? You smoke camels, you could roll it. They roll it. Listen, the guys who rolled them up in their sleeves, yeah. they smoke camels. You didn't mess with those guys. Yeah. You didn't mess with anybody who smoked camels. Bud said, I didn't do it. She looked at me. She said, don't, before you say anything, I, I am tougher on liars than I am stealers. Now, I, know, I know I've been had. She said, okay, I, pr I appreciate the fact that you're honest, Ronnie. Thank you. I thought, Da 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 da. da. <laughs> so the next day when I come home from school, she lit up a cigar and took me into a little bathroom and said, "I won't see you until the whole cigar is smoked." <laughs> I was done with smoking. Yeah, I couldn't stand to be around anybody who smoked. I I don't even need that. That was my fifth cycle. <laughs> Listen, here's the question. I don't know where I where I went with all foolishness, but what was the sin? What was the sinning willfully? Willfully mentioned. See, what was what was 
it that was mentioned? It's in verse 25. Yeah. What, but listen, where were they going? They, were, they, went back to the, they went back to the Jewish assembly. They went back to the old covenant. In context, what was the knowledge of the truth receiving being, say, being, being sinned against? Well, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter 1, he tells them, he tells them, look, the old covenant was to point you to Christ. Christ has come. It's out now. That's basically what I wrote down all that. I just got more technical. What doctrinal point did the writer make regarding this issue? It's found in the, it's found in the apodicy of the then. There is no longer, if you, if you, if, if you can't give up Jesus Christ who dies on the cross, buried and raised from the dead and think you can go back into the law and, and, and everything is okay. I don't think so, Ronnie. No, I don't think so. Uh, here's a cigar. No, I don't think so. Well, the lesson that was. I mean, she killed two birds with one stone that day. Well, actually three. She got her son and got stealing and got smoking. <laughs> she rolled all that up in one package. <laughs> hey, I tell you. She was hardcore. She was hardcore. Hebrews, Hebrews, the 10th chapter 4 through 18, not, not to do it now, but later, I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. You ought to go in there and look at the word sacrifice to see how important the sacrifice, to see how important the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for the sins of humanity so that they could come to God by grace. See how important the word sacrifice is to God. See how many times. Listen, I'm going to give you the number so that you don't miss the count. Eight. Now, it's worth your time sometime when you're sitting on the commode smoking a cigarette, a cigar, <laughs> to count them. Count them quick, though, and quote them early. Eight times. And I'll tell you, when you find a word like that in a dramatic moment with God, and he talks about the sacrifice and he mentions it eight times from 4 to 18. That's a dominant idea in it. It's well worth a look. I can tell you that. But here's how it's summed up in Hebrews 10, 18. Now where there is forgiveness of the, these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. You see, now the, he said that in 18. He said it again in verse 26. Yeah. Uh-huh. Point three. Now, I'm preparing you for tomorrow night. These Jewish believers were forsaking the Christian grace assembly and returning to the Jewish law assembly. By Acts, listen, this will be brought out in the second section of the fourth warning. Now, listen, they were under enormous persecution for their faith in Christ. I'm not belittling that. They were under great person. And we'll read about that. Not next, but in, next week we will read about it. Not tomorrow night. But they were under great conflict of suffering. And they, they don't want to take it anymore. They could have left town, but they went back. Right? He said, get out of, get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. Because Dodge is going to go down in a flame. But they chose not to do it. They chose to stay for whatever reason. <coughs> And, uh, he's, and the writer says, listen, and he's warning, this is 64, six years before this is going to come down, <coughs> at least 64, this 64, 65, he's pounding this, he's saying, he's saying For, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. You have no idea. <coughs> this guy knows the fifth cycle. This Hebrew writer, writer understands that. And he, 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 like a good prophet, he's preaching to the people. By Acts 15, which is 49 A.D., the law had been brought into the assembly teaching of the Jerusalem church. It came in conflict with the grace mechanics of the gospel. You know the message, Jesus dies on the cross, is buried and raised from the dead. The mechanics, you got to believe that. That is the object of your faith. And that's when grace works in conjunction with your faith. 
You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. That's pretty powerful. And when you read at the church conference in Acts 15, when you read about this, you can see this. I gave it to you in Acts 15, 1 through 12. And the, the, the conflict over the messages in verse 1, verse 5, verse 11 of Acts 15. They were saying, listen, the, the one part of the church, they said, we believe just like Paul does, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. We differ with Paul in this regard. We believe that you have to also be circumcised in order to be saved. You add anything, you, you, if you add anything, you abort grace because you're saved by faith through grace and not of yourself. Listen, the only circumcision that ever amounted to anything was the one that Christ had, and he died on the cross for it. You ought to read Paul's description of that in Galatians 3. But in Acts 15, this became an issue, and it was resolved. An apostolic creed went out for the church, emphasizing new covenant grace. In Acts 21, which is now in the late 50s, legalism had become a doctrine in opposition to Christian grace theology and the apostolic creed decree of Acts 15. Here it is in Acts 21, 2021, out of the mouth of these people. These are legalists, Christian legalists. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, See, brother, the, 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 they heard Paul's report, glaring report, about how many Gentiles were being saved. And so uh, they say, uh, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother Paul, how many thousands there are among the Jews who have believed, and they are all zealous of the law. But they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are coming among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the custom. You see the war? This is within the church. And it is still there. It is still there. I tell you, there is never... Never a week of my life as pastor of this church, 44 years, not a week that I can remember. I have not had to fight the war of grace. Not one. I either get it by mail, telephone, or walk-ins. Even doctrinal people disagree with me on grace. Quote, doctrinal people. I don't know what that means. It means they ought to know better. Yep. <laughs> That's what it means to me. <laughs> now this, look, this whole thing should have been resolved in 49, but in the late 50s, it's still going on, and it's growing. You understand? They're talking about numbers here. And uh, zealous for the law. Oh, my goodness. Look, at you know what they're doing? Listen to me. This is an old thing we used to talk about, Johnny. They're putting a nail in the coffin. I tell you, the one thing I don't want anybody building around my house, you can build a cabinet, you can build a garage, but don't build a coffin. <laughs> don't build no coffin. But remember that people would say, they put, you're putting a nail in your coffin. That's what they were doing. These, these legalists thinking, bring them back, bring them back, and they were bringing them back by the thousands to the fifth cycle of discipline. And the, the grace people were saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I suppose. I suppose. Well, uh, well, you couldn't stand under the law very long then, could you? Because this shows you how bad you were, didn't it? Right? If you know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, you know, it's ritual without reality. My pastor used to say, the law puts you in ritual without reality. <laughs> uh, the book of Hebrews now, when we're in the book of Hebrews, which we are, we're in the mid-60s. We're 64, 65. 
and we're in 64, 65, and in the book of Hebrews, persecute, the, the Jewish believers are being per persecuted. The ones who are being persecuted have gone back to the Jewish law assembly because, listen, they think they're better off. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? The writer of Hebrews, of course, is dealing with apostate reversionism. Tomorrow night, we're going to grab a hold of the same subject and dig our heels in. You will not believe the emails I'll get. <clears throat> but that's all right. A lot of things I thought I would be criti criticized for, I never thought it would be because teaching grace. <laughs> I never thought that. But, but then when I began to say, am I the Lone Ranger? And I went back and I studied. That's where great persecution against the church, against the church has always been. That in the message of the gospel. Oh. And when it's grace, it really goes under attack. People think. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, the the good news. The good news is, had you died, the moment you died, you'd have went like, "Whoa, what was I thinking? What was I thinking?" Right. But God, in His marvelous grace, put you into an enlightenment period of enlightenment in your soul. And he cleared all that up where your feet are here. And that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. After you close out, I want to ask questions. Okay. All right. Let's close this down because the guys upstairs need it. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful tonight for our study. Uh, we just looked at what the right, we, 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 we're, we have the easy task. We didn't have to write the Bible. All we have to do is study it. And I, I thank you for that. And, uh, and, be good, be good stewards of the word as we study it. And I pray, pray you would always keep us in that avenue of thinking. People are, they come into a passage like this and they get so screwy with it, Father, because they, they don't, I don't, everybody has in the sound of our voice the opportunity to look at this stuff. But we, we just want fast fooding all the time. We're just fast food junkies in the church. There's no way you can c come into a passage like this, Father, and give it any credence of what's really going on in time with fast food. Uh, we're a sit down and dine and take our time and enjoy it. And, and I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for a church that allows it. I mean, I have... I have pastors that write and say, I wish I could do what you do. I would love to be able to teach that way, but, well, you know, you pay my bills and I'm thankful for it and I'm going to be true to it. And, and I'm thankful for people come and support it. People want to know. It, it takes a study like this to dig into this. It takes, it takes isagogics, it takes exegeting, it takes categorical thinking. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you, Father, for a great pastor in my life, Bob Thien. Great pastor in my life that showed me the way of scriptural teaching. And I'm thankful for him. And so tonight, we thank you, Father. We pray that people would come back and study with us. Uh, they're going to really have to pay attention. They're going to have to put their thinking cap on. They're going to have to really study the scriptures. They're going to have to look and, and, and become knowledgeable of the other things that are going to come down the pike in this. There's so many doctrines that are, are attached to it. Give us, give us patience, Father, to be, you know, to be good stewards of our time and our, our message, to bring people into full enlightenment of the doctrinal truth. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself.
not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.